It's entirely mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We will settle down, please. So, welcome to our first in-person uh, session for our Python uh, for our quantitative training course. So, my name is Ahmed, and I'm sure. And you've already gone through lecture zero and heard my voice throughout the whole two-hour recording. This is Imran. He is the president of Blockchain, and he is going to be taking you through Pandas. So a few notices before we start. Uh, first thing, pizzas. I'm sure most of you are hungry because it's six o'clock. Uh, we did ring Domino's, but Domino's uh, said they don't have any drivers out right now, which I think is a bit of a lie. So it's coming at seven, not at six. And they'll be expecting a very angry customer service call tomorrow to ask for their justification. Other thing, so there's lots of events uh, which Imran will be posting on the WhatsApp group chat for crypto. So uh, please join that if you can. Uh, hoodies, um, I'm wearing one right now. Uh, we're going to be issuing hoodie merch sometime later this term. Um, you, some other societies have already started around £26, one that you may be familiar with. We're doing it around, what, £19, £20. So we're doing a bit of undercutting. Um, thanks to our negotiation skills. Uh, essentially, so uh, other than that, we have code for this trading course. It's up on GitHub, and we'll mention how to get onto that in a few moments. And should we just flip into the next slide again? So, um, so oh, while our computer is trying to cooperate, there we are. So this is how it is so far. Um, I've already done Panda, a Python. Imran will do Pandas, and then the course will sort of develop. So first one's a bit easier. Next ones get a bit more uh, challenging. Uh, they're still very do doable, and it's definitely good for you to try and challenge yourself, and you will learn quite a lot. And then at the end, um, we'll have Nomura, who is a very big Japanese uh, investment bank finance sort of thing, who will be talking about macroeconomics and how they do develop their own strategies. Um, so, try so uh, here are some QR codes. Uh, on the left is the GitHub, which you'll be using for the remainder of, for the course of this session. Oh, you're right. Sorry, my left. Um, whatever. My bad. Um, on the far left hand side is the slides from my uh, from my session, and they'll be very. And the slides for lectures. And there will be some Amazon codes somewhere not in that one. Not in, not in the ones that we released right now, uh, but there will be throughout this lecture. So please do uh, try and beat your. Uh, so please so try and get them first, essentially, to be able to claim your uh, gift. And uh, yeah, if it's gone, it's gone. Uh, and yeah, I'll leave it now to Imran because he's much, uh, he knows more than me about this. Um, but I'll be interjecting at some point to try and say, if I can help you out. Uh, just remember, it's not a, it's not a memorization skill. Um, just try to, uh, it will help you try and understand it as well. And if any of you are struggling with any computing stuff, I will do my best along with some of our team from IBG, who will be here to assist you. So without further ado, if you could please give Imran a round of applause and we'll get going. Hello, guys. Um, um, so, yeah, there are three ways in which you can get the code for this session. Um, two of them are a bit of a shortcut way. It's not usually, usually like the conventional way you do it. Um, but the first one is to go to this link. Got one download directory and then paste in the link that I put in the slide. And if you're wondering like, how am I meant to type out this whole link, I'll put it in the WhatsApp chat. So. And yeah, and then just if hopefully you have VS Code installed on your computer by now, if you've watched first session or just have previous programming experience um, or any IDE actually, so like PyCharm as well, um, and it should work, just open it up and then you have a local computer file. Second method is um, joining the Gitpod IVG team um, and then opening that link up in step two. Um, but the thing about this shortcut is you can't change any code because everyone has access to the same workspace. So if you change one thing, then everyone else has it changed for them too. Um, I'll fix that for next session though. Um, and then there's a, the proper way, which is downloading GitHub desktop. Um, and then going to opening up your GitHub desktop, click on file, clone repository, click on URL, and then copy and paste the URL in that slide, which is the URL of the GitHub repo. And then you should find that on your IDE, um, it would have turned up. Um, so yeah, I'll give you like two to three minutes to do that. Um, yeah. Right, one minute. 
Oh yeah, by the way, I was going to have a look at those. They're not in the slides that I put in like, the QR codes. They're in this slide. And there are three up for grabs this session. Actually, has anyone here got Amazon code from Amazon code from us previously? Oh, two people. Uh, oh, wait, you got oh yeah, Pablo, of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I've given you enough time. So yeah, what is Pandas and why is it useful? Um, Pandas is generally known as a powerful Python library for data manipulation and analysis in Python. Um, it provides easy to use data structures um, and data analysis tools for handling and manipulating numerical tables or any, any data set really. Um, and where it's more, most relevant in quantity trading is financial data sets or time series data. Um, so yeah, with pandas, you can quickly and easily load, manipulate, visualize, clean data. You can do basically everything data related. Um, and so that's why it's one of the most popular libraries in the data science and machine learning fields, as well as the quantitative trading field. Um, so yeah, before we get started, if you haven't already, um, then install pandas into your environment. Um, you will need the pip package management system to use the line I included in the slide where it says pip install pandas. Um, so if you just type that into your terminal in your IDE, or if you're accessing the code via Git pod, then you don't need to do that because it's already installed in the environment um, and we're all sharing the same workspace, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned before, one of the main benefits of pandas is that it allows people to quickly and easily manipulate large data sets. Um, so you can clean, clean and format financial data, um, such as stock prices or trading volumes. Um, and then you can use that and analyze it to come up with like trading strategies, backtest it and see how well it performs. Is this recording? Yep. Cool. Um, and the reason why we also chose to teach pandas is because it's very beginner friendly. A lot of the functions and um, yeah, function, general functionality is very beginner friendly. It's very intuitive um, and you can do very complex calculations very easily, such as like, well, not complex, like moving averages and uh, coming up with other technical indicators when analyzing financial data sets. Um, so it saves you a lot of time and effort. So yeah, I'll just also like, Go through some pros and cons so that you guys are well aware of some shortcomings and some like benefits, I guess. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, it has a wide range of intuitive functions. Um, it provides easy to use data structures. Um, well, so it integrates quite well with a lot of other libraries, which is quite important. So like NumPy, uh, Matplotlib, uh, any other plotting libraries compatible with pandas. And there's, there's the machine learning ones as well, like scikit-learn. Um, it's also very well documented because of its popularity. There's a large of, like, community of people who um, basically answer your questions online and work on improving the library itself. Uh, in terms of cons, it can be very slow when the data set becomes very large. And quantifying that would be like in the millions of rows. Um, yeah, uh, it consumes a lot of memory as well. Um, and it also has uh, poor compatibility when it comes to higher dimensional data structures. Um, yeah, like, so once you go three dimensional and beyond, uh, Pandas isn't the best performing library for that. Uh, yeah, you could say like libraries like TensorFlow are much better for stuff like that. So 
let's go into the crux of this whole library and mention and uh, outline what easy to use data structures pandas has. So there are two, a series and a data frame. A series is a one dimensional labeled data structure, uh, which is which can store data in various formats. So on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see left hand side, yeah, left hand side of the screen, you'll see one column uh, called name, uh, and then sub highlight the column name which in green, same, and then on the left you have like an index, so it's an identifier or, or a row label, um, and it's, again it's quite intuitive. Um, and then you have a data frame, which is a sort of a two dimensional data structure. It's very similar to an Excel spreadsheet. So you have rows and columns and a data frame can be thought of a collection of series. So really and truly, uh, the pandas library is just made up of series, given that a data frame is a collection of series. And we'll demonstrate this in our code soon. So you can see in the graphic, you have series one and series two, and you can combine them and it will become a data frame. Does that make sense? Issue. Cool. So yeah, um, in Python, when you want to use a library, you have to import it into your code, um, and usually you just write import name of the library, so import pandas. And if you want to make your life easier because you know you're reusing that library over and over again, you would probably attach an alias to it. So you write import pandas as PD. So every time you want to access a class, so Ahmed went through classes last session in a pre-recorded lecture, um, you would write PD dot instead of pandas dot. It just makes your life easier and it's just convention really. Uh, and if you know you want to access a specific class from a library and you know you're going to be using it over and over again, then it's a good idea to write uh, from pandas import class name. So data frame, for example. OK, cool. So in a pre-recorded lecture, Ahmed went through a lot of uh, inbuilt data structures in Python. So you had like lists, dictionaries, tuples. Um, I don't know if you went through any 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 other ones, but um, yeah, so pandas is very powerful in the sense that it allows you to very easily convert uh, the standard data structure in Python into a, a pandas recognized data structure, so a series and data frame. And what this allows you to do is once you've converted them into series and data frames, you now have access to a range of functions that have been coded in the pandas library. Um, and so for the next few slides, I'll just go through a few ways in which you can convert traditional data structures into a series and data frame. Just to add as well, the point of pandas is you have, so as, as uh, Imran mentioned correctly, you have essentially lists, but there's very limited functionality with them. So what you're doing here is you're sort of extending it using code that somebody else has written to sort of do a bit more data analytics. That's why you're doing, that's why you're using pandas in the first place. Um, you can, in, in theory, you can write all these functions by hand, but there are, well, there's, two, there's gonna be two problems with that. One of them is gonna be labor intensive if you aren't a very advanced programmer. And the other one is that because of the nature of how pandas is written, it's written in a language, I believe called C or an intermediate called C Python, mm -hmm. it's faster. So it uses, it's more efficient in using your computers uh, memory and whatever it is. Um, so that's why you use pandas over the traditional lists. Uh, some of you might be wondering why we're using pandas, and I just thought to clarify that. Carol. Yeah, there's the other code. Yeah, so here I've defined a list called coins. It has four elements, so four elements, and they're all strings, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, and they're all just names of cryptocurrencies. Um, and it's as simple as just um, using the series class in pandas. So you just write pd.series, and then inside the function, you pass in the name of the data structure, so coins. Um, and then I, t I assign it to the variable called coins underscore series. And it can print it for verification to see like what the output is. And as you can see, it's a series. Um, and I've just done, done some string formatting here where I've said print string, the type of coin underscore series is, and then curly brackets dot format, the type of the 
of the variable. Um, yeah, it's just a nice way to verify the types of variables that you have. And you probably would have seen that, just like I mentioned before in the slides, in the slide previously, the structure of a series is such that it has um, it has a column and then it has an index. So this is the index zero, one, two, three. And it, by default, we will always assign it by like integer position in the data structure. So Bitcoin is the first element in that list. And so it will be, it will be the first row in the series. Um, and you can also convey it into a data frame. There's really not, not much difference in terms of how it's structured. It just, I guess, looks a bit prettier, but you just get access to a wider range of functions. So yeah, pd.dataframe. And then you can also have a list of lists um, to a data frame. Um, So, yeah, you have a list that contains as its own elements a list. And so you have Bitcoin, 100,001, and then the next element of that list is a list that has Ethereum, 20,002, and so on. And it, to convert that into a data frame is as, simply as, it is as simple as just passing it again into the data frame class. And you can also pass in so functions have parameters. Ahmed went through part went past this through this last session. Um, and when you instantiate a data frame object, so when you create a data frame object, you can pass in into the columns parameter a list of the column names you want. Um, hope that's intuitive. So you have PD of data frame and brackets coin underscores info, which is a list of lists. And then the next parameter is columns, um, which is the list of the columns. Um, and you may notice that um, each sub list represents a row. So the first list in the in the list of lists is the first row of the data frame. Does anyone have any questions? And then you can also have a list of dictionaries. Again, pretty intuitive. You have key value pairs um, for each element in a list. Um, sorry, you have a dictionary in each element of the list, and each each dictionary has three val three key value pairs for three columns. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty intuitive. I don't really know how else to explain that. Um, and then instead of a list of dictionaries, you can do the opposite opposite way around. So you have a dictionary of lists um, where you have key value pairs where each key represents a column. And then the values are lists of the of the values in the data frame. So you have the coin, yes, you have the coin column, and then you have the coin key in the dictionary. And then under the coin column, you have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, which has come from that list. The, the corresponding what value to the key. You can also have a dictionary of series. Um, again, pretty intuitive. I'm just gonna rush through this one because it's it's not, it's not even really it's not common to see something like this. Anyways, um, you can also have a list of tuples. So if you have two lists and they're both the same length. Um, what you can do is you can use a, a built-in function in Python called zip. And what the zip function does, it looks at the it looks at the position of an element in there, and it will join two lists together based on that position, if that makes sense. So you have Bitcoin as the first element of the coins list. You have what is it, 10,000 or 100,000 as the first element of the second list. And what the zip would do is it will turn that into a tuple. So Bitcoin, comma. 100,000 or 10,000. Um, and then, yeah, pretty intuitive. So you can see there's a graphic there that if you had lists 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and you use zip, it will create it will create like these tuples that you see on the right of that zip. And then you can convert that back into a list. Um, and then you pass that into the data frame uh, class. Just, just to add as well, this is very common if your data is what we call fragmented. 
So often you'll be working with data sources separately and you need to find a way of putting them all together. So by looking at the zip function, like Imran said, you're essentially sort of join, lining up the elements that have the same index. So for example, number one in the top list has an index of zero because we start from zero in computer science. Likewise, the index for, uh, for number five in the bottom is also zero. So when they match, they're essentially, well, zipped together into a tuple that we've mentioned in the previous lecture. And this is very much applicable if you're doing sort of data organization before you start doing some data analysis. So everything that we're talking about right now is to do a sort of cleaning data and putting it all together. And it's very, and if we, it's, that's the way you sort of understand these functions, not just what they do explicitly, but also see their application in terms of the data analytics that you do. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Hold on. And then the last one, I guess, converting a data frame into a series. Um, and so, like we mentioned before, uh, data frames are made up of series. So if you extract a column from a data frame, then you have a series. And so that's basically what this slide is saying. You can filter out for a column, and we'll go through this again later on. You can filter out for a column using um, referencing the data frame that you've created, so the variable that you've assigned um, to the data frame, and then square bracket, square bracket, and then inside the square bracket, the name of the column. So you have coin underscores df, which is the data frame I've saved from, I think, the previous slide. Um, and then just accessing the coin column, and that should return a series. And you can verify that again, hinting the type of that variable. I noticed as well, as so you have the same stuff that you use to uh, access elements in a dictionary as well. So a lot, of, um, a lot of these margins that you've got, they also match them. That's why the computer over here just from anyone so people can hear me in the team's call. A lot of the syntax that you read in, in uh, Python when you look at new stuff, it will seem intimidating to you at first, but it's sort of built on, it's built up on fundamentals that you already know. So, for example, this syntax is based off dictionaries. Um, so that's why I love the things that you see. So you're probably thinking, oh, I've done this in the uh, in this dictionary section. So that is not a surprise. A lot of this code, a lot of what you'll see is really pre-built on your fundamentals. And it's important that we taught you fundamentals before you came here. Um, so yeah, there's just add that as well. So it's nothing to be worried about. All right, so we've covered using traditional pandas structure, sorry, Python data structures and converting them into panda series and data frames. Um, but more commonly what you'll see in, in the real world is dealing with different file formats. And so the next few slides we'll be going through um, some of them. Uh, and so one of, probably the, one of the most common ones is the CSV files, so the comma separate file. This is sort of like an Excel file, but it's just like everything is compact and separated by commas. And Pandas has a very intuitive function called read underscore CSV, which just allows you to pass in a file path of a CSV file. Um, and it will literally try and convert that into a data frame. Um, and so the function is read underscore CSV. Uh, so yeah. And this function is like very dynamic. It has like, I think it has like a hundred different parameters you can pass into it just to customize how you want to read the CSV file into, into your code. Um, and so, for example, you can specify which, which row of the CSV file that you're reading from um, you want to have the columns of the data frame as. So if you know that, or generally speaking, most CSV files will have the, the column names. If they do have the column names in them, they will have the column names as the first row. So you just pass set it equals zero. But that's the default argument anyway. So even if you don't pass in anything, it will automatically take it as um, you wanting to take the first row as the, the column the column row. Um, as an exercise, you can change the code to another number and see what happens. If you're on Gitpod, don't do that because it'll mess up everyone's code. Or you guys can agree to all for one person to do that, and you can watch. Actually, let, let me do it. I'll do it. Yeah, you can see I've read in the CSV file. Uh, let's change this. So you can see, like, because I've passed in header equals zero, it knows to take, so this is the file, basically. It knows to take the first row as the header. But if I change it to, like, say, three, it takes the third row as the, the row for the columns. Uh, 
And then you can also respond to specify what column you want as the index. Um, and again, this is very common in financial data sets where you want to sort things by time. Um, and so if you know that your CSV file has a column, a date column, then you can pass in date uh, or the name of the date column into the index underscore call parameter. Just to add to that as well, um, if it runs. Yeah, so if you can see that table there, the numbers that go down the bottom, the far left is what you call your um, uh, index, uh, your index columns. Is that correct? Yeah. So those are the essential. So if you go downwards, that's obviously uh, going uh, down the column. If you go from left to right, it's going across a row. Um, in pandas, is what you call the record as well, because these are each individual moments in time, basically each individual record. So rather than having your index being the tradition, the default zero to n, being n being the number of records that you have, you can also have the index as the date, which might be more uh, beneficial. Uh, when you're organizing your data and accessing it by the index itself. So it's easier to actually scroll and find a specific date than it is to scroll through a specific index. You'd rather want the 3rd of September 2018 rather than data record number 5034. That's why you actually do provide an index column to make your life a bit easier uh, in terms of the human readable readability of the code. And then you can also specify what columns from the CSV file you actually want, because sometimes you might not want all the columns. So if there's a use cause parameter, you just pass in a list of the columns from the CSV file that you want. Simple as. Um, and then, yeah, there are so many more arguments that you can use. If you want to have a read about all the different things you can do, then click this link and it should it should get you all the different all the different stuff you can do. Uh, yeah. Excel files, again, like almost the exact same functionality as the CSV file function. Um, just a prerequisite, you'd have to uh, download the open PY Excel um, library. Um, yeah. And again, reading in an Excel file that I've saved here. Doesn't let me open it, but anyways. Um, and then if you have an Excel file with multiple sheets, you can specify what the sheet name the sheet name of the Excel or Excel sheet that you want to read in. Um, and so I, don't, I know it doesn't let me open it, but it, this this Excel file actually has two sheets. Um, I think NFT transactions and NFT volume. Uh, so I specify one NFT transactions. Um, and then, yeah, you can see that we have a lot of NAN values, and that's probably because um, those cells are empty in the Excel file. We'll go into handling NAN values in a bit. Just to add to that, NAN means not a number. So it's not a specific data type that we've called. It's not an integer. It's not a flow. It's not a Boolean. It's not a string. There's just nothing that you can give to it. Um, other, you might also hear the word undefined, I believe, is the other, or not, uh, undefined, basically just not a data type in the first place. Nothing exists in that position. And we'll have to try and fill that in uh, if necessary at some point. Sorry, I cannot see any screens. Okay, good. I see the problem. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, right, how do I fix this? Let me stop sharing. That should fix it. Okay. Hopefully that's all it. Um, and then here I just give an example of how you can um, you can you can like read in multiple sheets. Um, the reason it's not working is because this file is wrong. So let me just fix that quickly. Yeah, for some reason in Gitpod, it didn't work with relative file paths. So I'm just doing this very shortcut met method. Should work. Yeah, so you can see um, it passes in a dictionary of data frames based on like the sheet names that you pass in. So this would be the NFT underscore transactions. And there's a second entry to the dictionary, which is uh, the NFT marketplaces sheet. Um, and then another popular like file source is the HTML files. Um, 
Yeah, let me just bring up the PowerPoint for this. So HTML stands for like hypertext markup language. Uh, it's a way for people to create websites by using special code. It's like, just think of it as like a recipe for a website. Um, and we can communicate. Oh. We can communicate with web pages um, via certain commands like get, um, and it allows us to access like certain elements in the web page. And P Pandas has a built-in library called requests, which allows you to easily communicate with these web pages. Um, and so if you write into your terminal, people install requests, people install JSON. Uh, JSON is, again, I'll go into that in the next slide, actually. Um, and then you import these libraries. And then what you can do is you can specify a URL that you want to read data from. So here I've included a, a URL that I frequently use for reading like NFT volume. And what you can do is you can use the get function in the request library, pass in the URL, and then pass that into the pd.dataframe class. Uh, the, yeah, the pandas.dataframe class. And then you can print that out and see what you get. Problem is, once you once you do that, you get a very messy output. Um, and the reason is, is because when you read things from a web page, they can be very messy. Um, and the way to clean that up is by using JSON. And that's from the JSON library that I just mentioned. So you can do request.get, pass in URL, and then .json, and then you get things in a very nice like list, uh, list of dictionaries of all the data. Um, it's, just, it's just like a very standardized way of reading data from HTML pages. And then you can pass that into the P the data frame and all of a sudden things look much nicer. Um, and I also want to highlight this function, the tail function, which basically allows you to get the last 10 rows of a data frame, hence the tail, it's like at the end. Um, you can also change this to head and it should give you the first 10. these some cells first. The common thing in um, Jupyter is if your module doesn't exist or it doesn't have a definition, it's because you haven't loaded it in. So always make sure you run your Jupyter notebook before you start working with it, especially you import your stuff right at the very top um, as per standard convention. So you don't import modules halfway through your code as you might find later on or earlier on that your code doesn't work because it has what you call a dependency. Essentially, it needs something else for it to work in the first place, yeah. as Imran kindly demonstrated. Yeah, so head function, tail function, head is for the first n rows, tail is for the last n rows. Cool, so we've learned how to like convert standard Python data structures into pandas, series, and data frames, and then also reading files into series and data frames. Um, so now we'll move on to indexing and slicing data frames. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are familiar with indexing, like the, the concept of indexing. So when you have a list in Python and you want to access a certain element in a list, you have to index um, a certain element in the list. Like the, you have to index the either through the list or a specific position of the list if you know where the element is in the list. Um, and so in in pandas, you can do this using a few uh, properties. So the first one is the lock property. Um, yeah. And what, what, what the lock property allows you to do is access um, row labels uh, based, on the, based on the index. So I, you might have seen before, whenever we created a series and data frame, the index was by default the position of the of where you are reading it from. So it'll be like zero, one, two, three, four. But you can also, like we also demonstrated when we read from the Excel file, you can specify a, a, a column as an index, so a date. So you can use the lock function to access a specific, a specific row via its index. So if we want to access the first row, and because we know in this data set the index of the first row is zero, we can pass in zero into these into the square brackets. Um, and then similarly, we can, okay, this is, I'll just get onto this later. We could, similarly, we can also access a, more than just one row, we can access a multiple rows. 
so zero, one, two, three, so the first four. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that you can also make use of the index attribute um, for data frames if you want to find out, if you want to get like an index object return. Um, and why you'd want to do that is would be more apparent if you're like actually using some, yeah, it, it, it might not be apparent now, but like, and I can't really think of something on the spot, but like I have used it before. And normally what you do is like you, you'd convert it into a list. Oh. I did the wrong function. I go, I go through it later. Oh, I haven't looked. Okay, I see why it's not working. Just run all of this. 10 secs. Okay, anyways, ignore that. Uh, okay, so I see what I'm doing here. So I've read, I've read, um, I read it from this CSV file that we've used before using the read underscore CSV function, and then I've set the index to the date column via the set underscores index function. Which is another way of just saying the index. Previously, we passed it into the read underscore CSV uh, function before, like we did it here. We're like use underscores index or something like that. Um, but alternatively, we can do it later by using the set underscores index function. And then if we print the index, this is what we get. And then, like I said before, we can access the, the row based on its index. And then we can do multiple rows as well. Um, and then if we want to reset the index and we want to do this when so when you have like the date column as an index sometimes you can't do calculations um, on the date because it's the index and so sometimes what you want to do is you want to reset the index do the calculation and set it back to the index um, and so the reset index uh, function is very useful for that And you, you may notice that every time I use a, every time I do something to a data frame, I assign it to a new variable or I assign it to the variable it was before. Um, and it's a very good practice. But what I see a lot of people do is when they learn pandas is they'll do something like this. So NFT underscores DF dot reset index and then use make use of like this parameter in place equals true. And what that basically does is it tells the the compiler that you you basically overwrite the variable that you assigned it to and it gets very messy especially when you're when you're writing jupyter notebooks and you have all these dependencies and things have to go in order um so it's generally good practice to never do this so just always assign things to new variables even if you're assigning it to the same variable it was named before please don't do this other thing either where you do uh so this is called, i've got nft and then try nft2 nft3 nft4 and just keep on adding numbers to your names because eventually you'll run out of ideas as to what your variable is doing in the first place. It's got so many versions. It's a bit like so some of you, when you do your coursework, you do coursework final, coursework final two, and so on. So on. be very conservative in your naming. And especially in Jupyter Notebook, you can essentially what is known as preserving the state. So you can say, so basically, if you close this notebook and open it back up, the original variables will still remain in terms of their results. You just have to run them. Um, back again, but the original results will stay on the display. And so just remember to be careful with how you name your variables, not just what your variables do, um, because if you name them wrong, you can have a very hard time working out what you're analyzing in the first place. You got it. Nice. Um, so we covered the lock property. So there's also the ILOC property. Um, and this is actually indexing based on the position and not the index. Um, so the first row is just zero, and then for the first three, do zero, column three. It's very similar to slicing in slicing any list. Um, and then you can also specify, if you want to take the slicing even further, you can specify what rows you want and what columns you want. So in the, in the first two examples on the screen, you only specify the row. So it basically takes all the columns of that row. And similarly with the second example, but with the third example, you can specify what columns you want. 
Uh, and then you can also index columns. We've already done this. So you just pass in the name of the column or you can pass in multiple columns. And when you pass in more columns, double square, double square brackets. So like the, the list and then double square brackets, are, square brackets around the, the list. Um, and then similarly to accessing the index of a data frame, you can also access the columns just by writing dot columns and it'll return, it'll return the columns to you. And then you can convert that to a list because it makes it easier to deal with and you might want to do some calculations or I don't know. Um, yeah, oh, I see why it didn't work before. It's because I wrote two underscores list, not two list. Uh, so yeah, you can convert the columns to a list just like that. Okay, a very like powerful feature of pandas is that you can do broad Boolean ind indexing. Um, and what it, what that does is uh, it allows you to filter rows based on true or false values, so based on conditions. Um, so for example, you can create what you call a Boolean mask. Um, and so if you print NFT underscore DF is greater than 100,000, what it does is it returns a data frame with true or false, true or false, based on whether the value met a certain condition. So if the values in the data frame were less than 100,000, or is it less 10,000, um, then it would return false. And if it was larger than, so if it met the condition, it would return true. Just to, mention, just to mention that point as well, if you could just go back one slide. The reason why you call it a mask is in the same way that anyone would wear a mask, um, is that it covers, is that it essentially covers a lot of the data. So only the true, elements essentially is the stuff that you can see and everything else that you can't see behind the mask is false. So the mask is basically a certain condition that we apply. In this case, NFT data frame is greater than 10,000. So anything that does match that condition, as you saw in lecture zero, would come out as true because it's a condition. Anything less than that would come out as false. So um, just to sort of highlight why it's called a mask, it essentially hides whatever's false and keeps whatever's true later on down the line. And in this slide, we do put on the mask. So you index by inserting the mask into square brackets. So NFT underscore DF square brackets, the mask. Um, and it, what we'll do is it'll spit out, it's, it'll spit back out the, the values that return true in the mask. Um, and for where it was false, it would return N uh, NAN values. Does that make sense? No. Cool. Um, another way that you can do this is by using the isIn function. So in the first line, um, I use what you call a list comprehension. You don't have to do this, but it's just a very nice way of writing code. Um, so yeah, just a quick primer on list comprehension. Uh, actually, Ahmed, did you go through list comprehensions? In I did, no, it's sort of briefly explained. Like, I can do it. Like so in list comprehensions, you, what, you, what it allows you to do is squeeze four loops into a single line. Um, and so on the left hand side, in the middle here, you can see I define a list called low underscores volume, and then I write a for loop. So for I in range 0 to 1001, and that 1001 is not inclusive, so it's until so 10,000, um, I append I to the low underscores volume list. Um, instead of writing that in three lines, what I can do is write it into a list comprehension. So um, how you do it is you you define the variable, so low underscores volume equals square brackets, because it's a list. Um, and in the red, you have i, which is the output uh, for i in range that, which is like the collection, it's known as a collection. Um, and then you can also add conditionals. So in this, in this for loop, you have a conditional. So if there's meant to be an i there, if i, um, there's an, is an, is an even number, um, then you append, um, you append i into the low volume. So it, it will be like a, a list of even numbers from one, from zero to 10,000. Um, and then you can add that condition into the list comprehension at the end. So you have the output, the connection and the conditions, and then you wrap it into square brackets to define a list. Um, and so that's what I've done in the top. Uh, and, and then using the isn't function, um, Oh yeah, actually, what I've done before that. Uh, yeah, let me go into the code because it's much easier to see.
Where is it? Sorry, I've lost, lost my bearings. Right, yeah, okay. Okay, so what I've done, create a list comprehension, and then I've converted all the values to integers because I've re realized that this list, this list are all integers, right? And all the values in this data frame are floats. So it's much easier to deal with if I just convert everything to integers. Um, and then what I say is, I put this little tilde sign. And this tilde sign basically, is it tilde? Is that how you pronounce it? Um, it stands for not in Boolean logic. So I basically say, after converting into integers, if it is not in low underscores volume. So, okay, it's easier to see like this first. So convert it to integers, check if it is in, if that number is in that list. So between zero and 10,000, and then do the not of that. So like the opposite. And then that creates a, that, that basically creates a mask. And then you pass that in as the mask. And it basically does the same job as what we did here. Uh, it's a bit of a, bit of a more long winded way. Um, I guess it's just down to preference. Uh, and then you can verify that those two different ways are equal to each other by using the equals function. Um, and in this example, we use the Boolean mask on the whole data frame. Alternatively, you can just do it on a single column. So here we're doing on the avalanche. Um, again, using the mask. And you can also do multiple conditions. So when the avalanche column is less than a thousand and when the theorem one is less than whatever number that is, 10 million probably, uh, and they return you all the columns that, are, that meet those conditions. Um, and yeah, there, there's so, so many more like functions that we didn't cover in indexing, um, such as at and I at. So if you want, beat up on them. And then slicing again is very similar to just slicing it like a list. So returning the first three rows, you do like uh, nothing colon three, which is basically zero colon three is the same thing. Um, and like the general structure is like, this is like rows, this is columns, oh, columns. And then this will be like the step. Um, and so if I just don't pass in anything in between the columns, it assumes that I want everything. And then the step is minus one, so it's telling it to go backwards. And so like the last row will be first when it's in, in the output. And then if I want to return every other row, I define the step as two. Cool. Okay. So we covered like indexing and slicing. And then sometimes you also want to combine data frames, and that's very easy. Just use the concat function. Um, and so in this example, what I've done is just for the purpose of demonstration, I've sliced the NFT data frame into two. I know it has 20 rows, so I just sliced it into 10 rows and then the next 10 rows, um, and then just passed it in as a list into the concat function. And then you should see it just comes up. You, you just get the same the same original data frame as the output. Um, and then you can also adjust the axis parameter. I don't know if we, I think we've mentioned it down the line. Yeah, so the axis parameter allows you to define along which axis you want to do operations on. Um, and so by default, it will always process things at a row level. So like this way, um, sometimes you want things to process like through columns, basically. And this will become more clearer through examples. So instead of saying, yeah, so this example for it, instead of saying axis equals zero, which is the, which is the default, if you, if you type in axis equals one, um, it joins this way instead of this way. Um, so you have, instead of having 20 rows, you have 10 rows, but then you have the first 10 rows on the left-hand side and the, the next 10 rows on the right-hand side. Um, yeah, sometimes you might want to do that. 
Um, okay, yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of you might have come across like all these different types of joins. So like left join, right join. Um, this diagram kind of shows most of them. Um, so inner join is just basically finding all the common um, common rows between two data frames. A left outer join would be finding all the ones in a in in a, in one of the data frames, and then the right will be in in the other one. And the full outer join would be like finding all the different combinations of rows in an, in two data frames and then a cartesian one is just basically like finding all the different combinations of rows between two data frames um that one is a bit more like rare to come across and then there's also other ones but you can read up about them in more detail in your own time i think we'll cover we'll cover how left joins work here so what i've done is i've just created two data frames um one called DF price and DF rank, and then they both look like this. And what I'll do is I'll do a left join. And when you do a left join in pandas, you use the merge function. And the first parameter you pass in is data frame one and then data frame two. Um, and it always assumes that the data frame one is the left data frame. Um, and that's what makes sense because it's on the left hand side of the, it's on the left hand side to the second one. Um, and then you also have to specify how you want to merge it. So left, right, inner, outer. And then you specify on what column do you want to join on? So, because we know both of those data frames have the coin column in common, then we join on the, on the coin column. And then in your output, in your code, you could probably see that there's a NAN value. And that's because um, Dogecoin, which is the fifth row of the DF underscores price data frame, doesn't have a equivalent row in the rank data frame. And so it just tells pandas to return an NAN value in that, in that uh, cell. And then sometimes you can specify like the indexes you want to join on. Um, yeah. And because we're not joining on the index and they both have um, the same, they, 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 because they both have like the, the same coin column, because you're no longer joining on the column, right? You're, you're joining on the index. And because, because they both have the coin column, what pandas will do is assign a suffix to each respective column. So it'll be coin underscores X and coin underscores Y. And again, because Dogecoin doesn't have um, any any data in the second data frame, it will return NAN for both of those columns. Um, and this is just something to do in your own time. Just if you want, uh, try out all these joins. Uh, yeah. There's also, Alternatively, you can use the merge as a function, and I put a demo in that in the Jupyter notebook, but there's no time to go through that. So, what I'll do is, yeah, just just read the, just read the notebook. Um, it explains it quite clearly. I have to go pretty quickly because we're running out of time. Um, and then, like in pandas, you can do all these different calculations between columns by like literally using vectorization. Um, and so you can specify a column and multiply it by another column, and then create a new column through that. And, and so I created a new column called volume by multiplying the price column by the quantity column. And it just knows to multiply each each element side by side and return something and then put it in a row. So put it in a column. And sometimes you want to drop columns. So you just use the drop function, simple as. Um, and then if you want to drop a, if you want to drop a column, it's better to define the axis because sometimes pandas might assume that you want the row. Um, so just define the axis as one, which basically means you want the column to be dropped. And if you want a row to be dropped, you, you'd use axis equals zero. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, I, I was going to go through replacing NAN values. And so you, you, one of the ways you could do that is using the replace function. Um, and in the replace function, there's the two underscores replace parameter and the value. So what do you want to replace? And what do you, what do you want to replace? What do you want to replace? And what do you want to replace it with? Uh, so you want to replace the NAN values. Um, so you, you may notice I wrote np.nan, and that's because I've imported NumPy as np. Um, so like all the NAN values in a pandas data frame are of the NumPy.nan type. Um, and so that's why I've specified np.nan. And then I want to replace all those NAN values with 0 0.1. Um, I won't go through that second example because it's a bit confusing. 
you just tell the data frame to fill every NAN value it finds with a value using the fill NA function. Um, and then there's also other parameters as part of that function, such as the limit function, telling it um, once you've found a certain number of NAN values, then stop filling in those NAN values and leave them. Um, and there's also different methods you can pass into filling NAN values. So like um, pad, well, what pad will do is it will look at the first, so when it finds an NAN value, it goes back and looks for the first non-NAN value and replaces it with that value. And then B fill is the opposite. It looks forward. Uh, yeah. And then you can also interpolate. Uh, just going to brush through these because we don't have much time. Um, and then you can also, instead of filling for filling NAN values, you can drop rows or columns that have NAN values. Um, and so if I just did df equals df dot drop NA, what happens is I drop all the rows and columns with missing values. And so if like one row has, if one column of a row has an NAN value, it will drop the whole row. Um, and then you can you can also specify, oh, I only want to drop the column weight, not the row weight. So you could do axis equals one. Um, and then you can also specify um, how you want to drop them. So if if a row contains an NAN value, do you want to drop the whole row or do you want to just drop the column of that row? That makes sense. Um, and then data aggregation is also a very powerful tool in pandas. You can calculate the mean. Uh, you, calculate, you can also do like multiple aggregations on multiple columns. So on the last example, uh, you have the price with an ask column of a data frame. And then you can use the dot ag function and pass in a list of aggregation functions that are available to you, like on the left hand side. Um, and what happens is it should return something like this. Yeah, something like this. But as you can see, because the ticker volume is a string column, it doesn't really like it. So when it calculated the mean, it, it returned the NAN value, and then the sum was just a, it was adding strings. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really give you much information. Um, and so sometimes you can also pass in the numeric underscores only parameter like we did here. So it just looks for numeric columns. Um, and there's just a visualization of how the split apply, apply combine method works. Um, this is just a general like principle in like data aggregation where you have a data frame, it will split the data frame into sub data frames based on some condition. Then it will apply some aggregation functions on each sub data frame and then it will combine it back um, to give you some like nice summary of what the data frame looks like. Um, and this will become more clear here. So if we group and we, we can do this by using the group by function in, in, in pandas. So if we group by the ticker column and then we apply a sum function to that group by object, then what it does is it groups by the ticker column and then it sums by each respective column that the data frame had. Um, and then you can do that similarly with like different functions. And then again, you can group by ticker and then use the add function, pass in a list of multiple aggregation functions. Um, and they'll give you like a nice summary of uh, like st a statistical summary of each column for each ticker. Um, just more examples. All right, I'm not going to go through this because we don't have much time. In fact, we're running out of time, but you can read through what the apply function does. It's very powerful. Um, and then dealing with time series again, let's get through this. Just something I just want to quickly note. Um, when you're going through, when you're ha when you're dealing with data, um, sometimes it can come formatted in very like in various formats. So sometimes when you read data from APIs or financial APIs, you'll come across the the time data as a like a timestamp or some some weird like Unix timestamp. And so what you do is you normally use functions um, like strf time, which allows you to convert. Um, a, a date object to a string so that you, you normally you do that when you're doing chart visualizations because you don't want like zero zero zero, zero like the hours and seconds in your charts um 
or you, you want to convert the timestamp into a date time object. So use the front from timestamp. Yeah, I'm not going to go into it because we're over time, but feel free to go over this in general time. Um, and then you can also resample date, date, like dates. Um, let me just show you here. It's more here. Yeah, so if you have a data frame with like uh, different dates, you can use a resample function so that it converts all the dates to like a common, like a common date. So like the end of the month, so that you can see the first row is the twenty fifth of May twenty twenty two. And if you resample by month, so by passing in M, which is the character code for month, um, it will give you the the last date of May, um, and so on. And then you can also use aggregation functions on this resampled data. Uh, and it will automatically group by the month and sum it over. Um, so you can see there's two rows for the 31st of May, so 75 plus 1,000, and it'll give you 1,075. 1, um, but what if you wanted to keep the, originals, the, the original rows? So like you can see squeeze it into three rows because it's three different months. Um, what you do is you use the transform sum function. Uh, and then quickly plotting, uh, Pandas has very good support for plotting. It has a lot of, uh, by default, it supports map.lib in the back end. Um, yeah, are the pieces here, by the way? No. All right. In the back end, it supports uh, map.lib, and it's simple as just writing data frame. So the name of the data frame is NFT underscore transactions, dot plot, specifying the X and Y axis columns, and then you'll get like a plot like this. And then you can use the rolling function for moving averages. So you can see here, like the spikes in the plot are very sharp, and that's just the nature of NFT transactions. Um, and so if you want to smoothen out that data, you can use rolling at, uh, moving windows, and you use that by doing the rolling function, specifying what your window size is, um, and then doing an aggregation function on that. And what a rolling function basically does is, um, it creates a window in your data frame. So like, say you have 60 rows in your data frame and you want a, oh, you want to do a moving average of 30. It'll start off looking at the first 30 rows of your data frame, um, apply some aggregation function. So sum, so, oh, sorry, mean. So calculate the average of the first 30 rows, and then it will shift the window down by one row. So from row zero to 30, from row one to 31, from row two to 32, and it'll keep doing that until it gets to the end of the data frame, calculate all those means, put it in a data frame, and it what that basically does is it smoothens out your data, right? So you get a very smoothened out plot. Um, and then I've included a script to basically plot um, one, two, three, four, five, six different moving averages in one chart. Um, and then I also changed the legend, so you can see, yeah. Yeah, change the legend here. And then you can also pass in multiple y axis columns as well. Um, which I do in the first line of code. And the second block of code, I just use, I just make use of all these different parameters to format your charts more nicely. So, like declaring your title with the x label, the y label. Um, and then if I try and plot this, you can see that. Because there are so many, so many rows, the the x axis label, the ticks, or the, the the tick labels, they get squeezed and it just becomes unreadable. Um, oh wait, there's a code there. Um, yeah. Uh, what's I gonna say? You can fix this by one using the tail function that we mentioned earlier. So just looking at the last thirty, and then I also mentioned very briefly that you can use the SDRF time function to convert like very long timestamps into readable strings. Um, and so if you do that, actually, wait, this thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I take the tail function. Tail, yeah, tail 30, and then dot plot. And then I also just change the, the figure size just to make it a bit bigger. 
I specify the kind of chart I want as well, um, bar, and then I say I want it to be stacked as well, so I get a very much nicer plot. And then, yeah, like I mentioned, um, these dates are not really readable, they're just like timestamps. Um, and so if I make use of the apply function, which I didn't really go through because we had no time, um, I used a, I, I passed a lambda function into, into it, and Ahmed went through that last session, and I converted all the date the date field, the date of values um, into date time objects because they were timestamps before. So I used the from timestamp function. Uh, and that's from the date time dot date time library. Um, and yeah, yeah, as you can see, it's much better. Um, but then I can also make use of the strf time function to convert into a nicely format string. So I get rid of those zeros or like these numbers at the end. Um, and then just to have fun, you can also change the colors if you want. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Uh, generally, this session was just to give you an idea of things you can do in the pandas library. Um, the truth is you'll get the most out of it once you're actually implementing it in some like project or like in your like quantitative training strategies. Um, and yeah, what, when you're learning, I guess your best friend the Stack Overflow and ChatGPT. Um, and then I've, I've included like, some recommended extension yeah. It's a very good book, um, Effective Planners by Matt Harrison. Um, and yeah, some other things that we didn't really cover in this session, but we might um, throughout the rest of this series. Uh, time manipulation, statistical analysis, uh, rejects and string manipulation, which is very useful when you're cleaning data and then advanced plotting. So using libraries like Matplotlib, Seaborn, Altair, or, or Plotly. Um, and that's it. Yeah, thank you. He says when they arrive, I guess, it's way easy, but they're going to come and keep minus if they sit around. Maybe then can be fixed on a leash, perhaps as well. Um, we'll probably be able to give out one by the step, which is going to be a big mess. Give us a few minutes and get it sorted out.